So Steve, thank you for taking us to the library and we're gonna understand what the library is, where it is, and why um, why y'all have a Audubon <laughs> collection. Well, first of all, let me swing around here and tell you that we're in the Courts of Appeal building on the first floor at 361 Rao Boulevard in Annapolis. And you can see here, we're trying to maintain a very welcoming environment. Um, we've got plexiglass here they put in. And there's one of our fantastic reference librarians, Julia Roberts right there, who's waving at you. Um, you can see we've got eight public reference uh, computer terminals. We have Maryland uh, law books right back, uh, blocking everything. You can see the three different colors there, four different colors. And uh, some more reference space here and over here. And uh, if you walk this way, you can see that we've done a little bit more of an in-depth presentation um, just for the you know people who come here um, of John James Osborne's Birds of America uh, birds. And here's one of them now. This is the belted kingfisher. And the wonderful thing about it is that you get to kind of guess what he's up to here. This is going to be the male, and this is the female. And uh, does anybody know anything else about John James Audubon? Can you all hear me? We can hear you. So is, 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 you can put in the chat box anything that you know about John James Audubon to share with us. This guy is the Columbia J. Anyway, the State Law Library was founded back on December 11th, or maybe it was it was the 12th of November um, when this, the first library opened. And it was headed by David Ridgely. So if anybody picked David Ridgely as the first Maryland State Librarian, that is who it was. Um, we have more books over here. There's specifically on Audubon including this guy here. But th this is um, a recent book, and I don't know who published it. But um, I will slowly take you back over here to our special collections room. Um, like I said, the library started in 1827, so we're coming up on our 200th anniversary of our predecessor, Name library. It was called the Maryland State Library back in the 1800s because um, the, uh, and you can see that we have a little air conditioning issue in here today, but um, the uh, reason that uh, we got the Birds of America series back in the 1830s was because the state library was designed to be a little mini library of Congress. Um, if you recall, uh, Jefferson and Adams died both in 1826. And so there was a desire for Maryland to have its own 
little library that had things like English literature, English history, and lots of law because of course, the people who passed it were the General Assembly, the um, delegates and senators of the um, state. And um, funny thing about the air conditioning is that it went out about June 25th and we had to scramble at the end of uh, the um, uh, fiscal year to get air conditioning from last year on the books so that we can have it this year. But that uh, hasn't worked out quite that way yet. Um, I just wanted to show you that in November 1934, oh, we've got bobbleheads, Supreme Court justices, and people like that. Larry Hogan's over here someplace. Chief Judge Bell is over there. He's the former chief judge. But um, in November 1934, Thurgood Marshall, Baltimore, Maryland, signed in the register of the library. And it was interesting because um, when we changed the name of the library to uh, Thurgood Marshall, um, one of the uh, presenters had done some research and he knew the Stanton School was a segregated school and uh, they were talking about having a test case for that school. Okay, and we're going to pan around here, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, I'm going to try to put my gloves on here. We, um, gloves are not necessary when you are handling fine paper because um, they would rather, they being the um, people who make this stuff up, uh, would rather have you, um, sorry if everybody's getting dizzy here. Hold on. I'm still here. I'm just trying to get the... We understand we are trying to get you, it's hard to hold it on gloves on at the same time. <laughs> that yeah. Was um, so we have a couple of people who mentioned some about Audubon that he uh, was wealthy from a wealthy family. He was from France and he lived in Audubon, Pennsylvania. Um, actually, he was from Haiti. Haiti, from Haiti. He's Haitian. Um, that said, the word on the street, street is that his father owned a sugarcane plantation. Okay. Hopefully that's a little better. The first um, one that you guys asked for is the Baltimore Oriole. And as you can see, it was drawn by, from nature by him. And here it was engraved by um, R. Havel and colored by him. Actually, it was colored by, um, a group of ladies who would uh, sweat away the hours um, listening to uh, Audubon and Havel argue about um, 
which was uh, whether there is enough orange in the breast of the Oriole, for example, or whether the tulip poplars were too olive colored. Um, and uh, so they are an unnamed source of um, what really should be attributed to them because um, these were taken from etchings that uh, Audubon did when he was out in the country. And then they somehow, and I don't know how this works, they put a plate in and they press it down and you get the lines. Uh, you can see here the lines of the feathers. And um, God, every time I take a look at this, I'm just amazed. Um, so although Audubon deserves a lot of credit, the, what I think is brilliant, um, works of art that makes it so special is, um, not done by who we think it was done by. Any questions? about uh, the Baltimore Orioles so far. Eric, do you want to mention some things about the Orioles? Sure. So Baltimore Orioles are one of my favorite birds to show off in Baltimore. Um, they actually have a pretty healthy population in and around Baltimore. So as a little bit of background, I'm going to be talking a lot about these birds in the context of Baltimore, um, not necessarily Maryland as a whole, but kind of like kind of uh, connecting these birds to where I work in Baltimore. Um, and yeah, they are a neotropical migrant, meaning they uh, are here during the breeding season, usually arrive around April or May. Um, and then in their non-breeding season, they go to Central and South America. They're not a super, super long distance migrant in general. They tend to fly down to Central America, primarily in Northern um, South America. But one of the reasons they're one of my favorite birds to show off around here is because oftentimes they're in a super, super accessible place for people to see them. Um, because they do like this edge habitat with really, really large trees so that they can build these hanging dome nests that you see in this picture. Um, a lot of the historic parks around Baltimore, like Druid Hill Park, um, like uh, Masonville Cove, which have these huge, large trees in the middle of open fields, are perfect for nesting Baltimore Orioles. So oftentimes they're in all of these places where lots and lots of people are. And even though they're super, super bright, they tend to stick high up in the trees and are pretty small. So a lot of people don't notice they're there until you point them out. And then it's a really, really good opportunity to show people these really, really cool birds that are right where they already hang out. That's probably why they have, why Audubon put them in a tulip poplar because these trees are huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they like nesting at the very, very end of the branches so that predators uh, can't get out to the end of the branches quite as easily. Interesting. The next one we have is going to be the great-footed hawk. And uh, here's a little quiz question for you. Does anybody remember what the... Um, let me do it this way. Hopefully, this is a oops. We lost your visual, Dave. I take the gloves off. There we go. Can you see that? Okay, it's the bloodbath that's going on here when the um, great-footed hawk is uh, trying to feed its young for dinner. 
and we can see that this one here is a female because I think he's telling us that she's got eyelashes, at least on one side. And our uh, friendly, um, our friendly male does not have the equivalent eye structure or uh, eye lashes. And again, she's got kind of like a Mediterranean or a Near Eastern or even Asian looking eye because it's slanted. And his is much less slanted than hers are. And that's one of the things that I've learned about. I don't know whether it's true or not, but um, it's interesting. The other thing is that um, I asked you about the numbers, and this bird is what number? This is number 16. Number 16. And in fact, you all chose special numbers that were very close to a one, if not a one, or a five or a six. Wait, there were no fives, there were just sixes and ones, I think, for the most part. Does anybody know why that is? Well, I'll tell you why. Hi. Uh, it's because when John Audubon was sending out the plates, the um, prints here. He uh, did them in uh, batches of five. So this would be number 16, you said. Mm -hmm. This would be the third batch or the fourth batch of birds that Audubon had for sale. And so he needed something very dramatic. If you go to number 20, um, it would probably be sparrows or finches or something like that that were not too photogenic, but he felt obligated to, uh, to picture them as well. We do have a question from somebody. Is it showing up at your? Screen. No. It's okay. Yeah. Eric, you want to talk? It, we have a, it's a, it's a gray or great footed hawk. Um, and then Eric is saying it's actually a peregrine falcon. Eric, you want to, mm -hmm. to talk about the falcon? Sure. Um, so, one of the really interesting things that you can see in these types of historical works, particularly Audubon's work, um, is that he had a lot of freedom to kind of call birds whatever he wanted to call birds. Um, and we have a really, really good example of that coming up later. Um, but oftentimes what you'll see is that there are a lot of misnomers in what he labels birds uh, in terms of name. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, little neat historical backgrounds as to what he labels, uh, what he calls birds. My favorite example of that is the red-bellied woodpecker, which doesn't really have a red belly, but because he, <laughs> shot his birds and picked them up by the feet to look at them. He kind of got a really clear look at it and saw a little bit more of a red belly. Um, but peregrine falcons are a great example of um, birds that are really, really well adapted to urban living and living amongst people. And the main reason for that is because historically peregrine falcons nested on cliffs. Um, and when people moved in, they started building really big structures, especially in cities, like water towers, like shot towers, like office buildings. And these work as perfect substitutes for cliffs or peregrine falcons. Also, as you see in this picture, um, peregrine falcons are 
primarily a bird hunting specialist. So whenever you go to a marsh or something like that with lots of ducks like this gadwall and this green winged teal you see in this picture, you're often going to see a peregrine falcon flying amongst them and scaring them up. But in urban areas, peregrine falcons are really, really good at catching and eating pigeons. Um, so peregrine falcons are a really, really well adapted urban bird. They're also a really super cool bird. They're one of the larger species of falcons that are found very regularly all around the world. Um, and they also have the highest recorded airspeed of any bird um, in the world. And that's when they do their dive um, to go and attack to other birds. And they can go well over 200 miles an hour when they are in the middle of that dive. Wow. That's pretty cool. And let's see, the next one is the mockingbird, which I don't know whether I've seen before, but um, oops, let me get this out of the way here. This is a snake that is ingeniously put in with the mockingbirds in their nest. And I think it's a rattlesnake because it's got a rattle on it. And I am from Southern California. So I'm supposing that whatever he thinks is a, a rattlesnake really is a rattlesnake. But we can see the birds again and again two is a female and then she's got her eyelashes a little bit of a mustache or an appearance or something like that. eric do 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 female birds have eyelashes yeah so that is something i've meant to discuss in the previous one that i kind of slipped my mind um so certain birds you are able to tell their difference based on their looks, and that is called sexual dimorphism. Um, so a really good example of that would be the Baltimore Oriole. The male is much brighter orange, things like that. Um, in birds like the mockingbird or birds like the peregrine falcon, their plumage is nearly identical. Um, meaning just by looking at their patterns, you won't be able to tell the difference. Um, in the birds like the peregrine falcons, however, um, there's a pretty notable size difference between the male and the females, with the females being up to 30% larger. Um, with northern mockingbirds, you will not be able to tell the difference unless you have the bird in your hand or you notice certain types of um, certain types of behaviors, like the males will tend to sing a lot more, even though the females, especially in birds like mockingbirds, can sing quite a bit. Um, and while Steve is getting back on, I will uh, talk about one of my favorite parts about mockingbirds. Um, so mockingbirds are called mockingbirds because they are mimics, meaning they imitate the other sounds that they hear. Um, and there's actually a really, really interesting reason why they do that. And that is because the females are specifically selecting to breed for intelligence. So the way that works is the males sing as many different songs as they can remember, as many different sounds as they can remember. And whichever one remembers the most sounds, theoretically is gonna be the smartest bird. And the females then select for intelligence. And that's why there's a whole bunch of really, really cool studies that go and show that mockingbirds can recognize individuals of humans, even, even uh, accounting for differences in clothes, even accounting for differences in facial hair, all that type of stuff. They can identify individual humans after seeing them just once for their entire lifetime. Um, and these are very, very common city birds. Um, they're often the birds you're going to see um, sitting on, on uh, telephone wires, especially if there's a few bushes or medium-sized trees around. They don't nest in the tippy tops of trees. They nest, nest in kind of um, eight to 15 foot tall trees. So yeah, they're really, really cool birds. Um, that you're going to find all around the city and the suburbs. And is it and is it typical for a snake to come up there and grab a bird like that? Um, so I believe this is supposed to be a timber rattlesnake that's represented, and 
as a as snakes as a whole, very typical actually. Um, snakes as a whole are one of the biggest nest predators, especially in the exurban environment, so in forests and things like that, um, to eat the eggs and the babies of other of birds. Um, so for example, black rat snakes are one of the biggest nest predators of birds um, in Maryland. However, timber rattler snake, timber rattlesnakes don't really tend to go into bird nests. And that is another thing that's really, really interesting about looking at this style of field guide, which Audubon kind of um, headed is a lot of these depictions aren't necessarily to help people learn more about the birds or help people identify the birds as much as it's an artistic ex expression. And it wasn't until Roger Torrey Peterson in the 1940s and 50s where people doing a lot of um, illustrations for the point of science or identification started having more realistic and less artistic pictures. Yeah, and there were a couple of reasons for that. One was the photograph camera photography was not invented until the 1840s. And this was done in the 1830s. The other thing is that um, contrary to what was going on in Philadelphia at the time, which was high science, they thought, what they preferred was having the birds laid out in a still life, um, literally, uh, with almost X's in their eyes. Um, and Audubon took one look at that and it's like, I can do better. And so that's why he has all the flora and obviously you now fauna in his works. So that was um, something else that he was famous for. The um, each lithograph or aquatint or plate or whatever you want to call them was worth um, five. Five of them were worth eleven dollars. Um, because the first uh, volume was sold to David Ridgely at $220. And uh, there are 435 uh, original plates. We have 430 of them. Uh, we know that two or three got burned up in the um, Baltimore City riots at the time. But... Um, and these guys are the rough grouse. So, um, when I was selecting the ones that we were going to take a look at, we wanted to have a variety of different types of birds and that uh, uh, inhabit different habitats. So, I believe that this is a ground bird, Eric. Is that correct? Yeah, so this is a ground bird that tends to live in um, tends to live in heavily forested areas in very temperate regions. Um, so right around Baltimore is kind of like the southern-ish most extent, other than going down the Appalachians a little bit. Um, but once you get up to like northern Pennsylvania and places like that, especially on the west side, very very common in the deep forest. Um, Super interesting birds, very, very popular game bird, a lot smaller than you would think. And just like all of the birds in their family, um, the males have a absolutely crazy sounding um, call that they use during the lecking season to attract as many females from around the area as, as they can bring in. But especially in the area when Audubon uh, made this, they were extremely popular game birds. In the, for the region, both for hunting for their plumes and also for food. Are these about life size, you think? Because I, the mockingbirds were pretty close to life size because I've seen those before. But um, these guys, I'm just barely getting them all in. The, 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 I, the iPhone and uh, 
Yeah, so it's kind of hard to from I, I don't believe that he did one to one representation of bird size because there's certain birds that I don't think would fit in the book that he drew. Um, right. But standing from about foot to head, they would be about a foot and a half tall, uh, a foot to a foot and a half tall. So they're like small little chicken type things, which is also where they fit taxonomically. Well, I think they're very close to being one-to-one. -one. <laughs> That's my view. There's some uh, pine cones down there. But the coloring of this is just so incredible because you can look and see the feathers and the coloring of the feathers. And here you are, a 30 something year old woman with 10 kids and your husband is dead or overseas or something like that. And what you're doing is spending 12 hours a day or whatever it was, painting these damn birds. And I just think that's just amazing. I mean, it's nice we got the outline and the aqua tint or the lithograph or whatever you want to call it. But um, my money's on it. Definitely an untold story of these uh, of these prints. Yeah, it is. Um, I don't know whether anybody saw it in the Washington Post. I think it was about two weeks ago. The um, Mrs. Ivory Bill Woodpecker. I'm looking at that corner there. This I wrote it down. I'll back up a minute. The Ivory Bill Woodpecker is probably no more. But um, what I was going to say in the Washington Post was that. Somebody was calling Audubon's bluff in terms of uh, his non-racialism. It turns out that he fully knew that this bad slave owner was um, his friend and buddy and he named some bird after this guy. And it's opened up a whole new world along with Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. Should we be re really putting people's names in the pictures? The rough grouse, the mockingbird, the ivory bill woodpecker, we don't really need to worry about. But something would be something like Sydney's J or uh, the Roswell Titmouse or whatever. Um, they'd be named after these people who were not very nice. But anyway, I'm digressing, I guess, a little bit. Um, no, it is because we are looking at uh, a, a snapshot in uh, historical time and, and it's a cultural thing. He was selling these two people and uh, um, Eric, do you want to talk about the ivory billed woodpecker? I don't know if that's native to Maryland or not, but. Uh... Yeah, so I'll, I'd like to chime in a little bit on the bird name uh, movement right now. So the big new movement that he's talking about is called Bird Names for Birds. Um, and A, it has to do with, um, you know, a lot of the birds like Audubon's Oriole or, um, or just lots and lots of birds around Baltimore and around the country and around the world are named after mostly white colonial men. Um, and even if these are the most well-meaning people in the world who never did wrong in their life, which we know historically isn't true, um, these white colonial men claiming ownership of these species with their common name that have been known to the indigenous populations for thousands of years before these men came in really is just another uh, supremacist activity 
saying white values are more important than indigenous values. Um, so it's really, really important to start shifting things towards more descriptive natures so that we don't have these types of colonial uh, names on these birds. Um, but in terms of ivory bit woodpeckers living in Maryland, the, the answer is probably. Um, back in the 1850s when the noted decline or when the decline was first noted, they started doing a mapping effort of them and they didn't quite make it into Maryland, but by that point their population or their, uh, their range had already drastically declined. Um, and then by the early 1900s, they were really restricted to the very deep south because these bir were birds that needed really expansive, um, really expansive hardwood forests that when you have places like Baltimore and DC that used to be expansive hardwood forests, get cleared out for the cities doesn't really exist anymore. Um, there's a lot of controversy that was done for a lot of controversial reasons that I know a lot of the drama behind the scenes of that I'm not going to get into. Um, but the most recent controversial sighting, which I, uh, I, which uh, I have a lot of a lot of background information about, was supposedly in 2004, but that is almost 100% uh, not true. Um, the last confirmed real sighting was probably in the 1960s or 70s. Um, and the other birds that were sighted were very, very likely, um, were very, very likely pileated woodpeckers, which is now the biggest woodpecker that we have in North America. And these guys were, were bigger than pileated woodpeckers. So they were very, very large woodpeckers. And yeah, they, they uh, went extinct or presumably went extinct because they're not officially extinct on almost any of the lists. Um, both due to habitat loss and also due to hunting. They had a lot of pretty plumes, a lot, a lot of the same stuff that people hunted birds for a lot back in the day. Um, and kind of the last hope for a lot of ecologists for where their population remained was Cuba, um, because they used to have a very strong population in Cuba in the 1950s and 60s, but it does not appear like there's any there anymore. But in terms of their, their uh, parents in, in Maryland, Maybe I would lean towards yes back in the early 1800s, but nothing since the 1850s when their range started to get documented due to the reduction of uh, populations. Thank you. Unless we get their DNA. Um, so <laughs> we could try getting their DNA and there actually is some, some projects that I am not super, super familiar with that do try to gather DNA of endangered or highly threat or extinct species to try to reproduce them almost Jurassic Park style. Um, we're not there yet with the technology and the um, actual methods of the collecting the DNA, um, probably by the time the birds were dying out wasn't to our standard. So D DNA absolutely degrades um, very, very quickly over time if it's not stored correctly. Um, and since we haven't had any confirmed sighting since the 1950s or 60s, we probably don't have high enough quality DNA to do any of that type of preservation. But things like the northern white rhino, where we still have one living relative, exactly one individual, um, that could be a possibility, but again, long shot, from my perspective at least. This is the red-winged starling or marsh blackbird. And I would call it the red-winged blackbird. I don't know what anybody else would call this, but uh, they are in marshes around the country. And I think they're pretty widely distributed too, because I saw them when I lived in Southern California. And I saw them again here when we were waiting in line for all garden and uh, in uh, Columbia one time years ago. Many in Minnesota. And many in Minnesota, yeah. apparently. Yeah, so these are red wing, red wing blackbirds. Um, again, this is goes back to a lot of the uh, freedom that he had in naming birds. They are, so uh, the reason why they're called red wing starlings is because they have very superficial uh, uh, similarities to European starlings. Um, and another similar example of something that is named wrong because, of, or named, or is a misnomer because of their superficial similarities to European birds is the American robin, which is a thrush, but because of the color patterns, 
was named after the European Robin. Um, but yeah, I really, really like the description of seeing this bird in the Olive Garden while we waited in line because wherever there is a small marsh with cattails or phragmites or anything hanging around, you're very, very likely to find red-winged blackbirds. And they also are very widely distributed. But once you go out west, you also have the uh, smaller chance, but the chance of seeing what's called the tricolored blackbird, which is very, very similar to red-winged blackbirds in size, shape, and appearance, but it has a slightly different song and the red patches on the wings instead of being lined with yellow or lined more with white. Um, and also out west, you have the yellow-headed blackbird along with a few other blackbirds. But um, over here in Maryland, red-winged blackbird is the main blackbird that we get with a few other exceptions and a few other blackbirds that aren't named blackbird. Yeah, you know, I grew up in, in Los Angeles, so you're getting all fancy with me with the other types of species here. <laughs> I did want to um, show you again that even though this number two is labeled as an old female, she also has kind of slanted eyes and a little bit of a mustache or my passes eyebrows or uh, eyelashes rather. Yeah, so the, the big difference is between the old female and the young female is the old females can start getting a red patch on the side of their wings just like the males. The females typically don't have any red on their wings until they start getting really, really old but then they can start to appear like a young male and have that small amount of red on their shoulder. Mm. That's very interesting. This is the fish hawk or osprey. And it is really incredible. It's got uh, this rainbow trout-like fish in its claws. And uh, the osprey, presumably, this would be a male. I think um, the, uh, does it say over there? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the paper that Audubon used was of various sizes. And um, we have some of the plates here that have like a little fold down that says that it's a male or a female or what the other species is it might be representing the fauna or flora or something like that. But um, I don't see that here. So they kind of um, overdid it. You can see how they probably clipped his wing over there because he was just so big. But uh, look at his mouth, the coloring of his mouth and his eyes. And again with the feathers. Just almost in 3D, according to my iPhone. I mean, by the way it looks. Does anybody know what yeah. kind of fish this is? I'm not, I don't know about the fish. Eric, do you know? Um, I would say it looks bassy, but I'm not, I'm not positive about that. Do you want to talk about the uh, osprey? Sure. Um, so in telling the difference between male and female ospreys, again, just like most raptors, um, the female tends to be about 10 to 20 percent larger. But the other way to tell the difference is that the females tend to have a darker chest patch than the males. Um, but one of the coolest things about ospreys is their zygodactyl feet, which pretty much just means Instead of having the three uh, talons in the front and the one in the back, they have one talon that can rotate around. And that is mainly so that they can carry heavier fish. 
Because if they had three talons in the front and one in the back, they would have to carry the fish parallel or uh, perpendicular to their flight pattern. But carrying them this way because of their zygodactyl feet, they can actually carry them in the same direction that they're flying, allowing them to be more aerodynamic and catch larger fish. Okay, and then we have the raven. We had the Baltimore Oriole, so I had to put in the raven. Right, and we hold this guy out more than we probably should. Same with the Oriole too. Because um, when we first got these conserved, there was a conservation project that um, was in place when I got here in 2005. And uh, so all I had to do is fork over hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the contract. Um, but uh, the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts up in Philadelphia um, conserved these. They uh, put them in some kind of solution, saline solution or something like that. Tried to scrape off all the bad stuff like right here. And uh, and they gave us back these birds are in beautiful shape. They're just gorgeous. The colors are just still so vivid. And he's obviously in some kind of nut tree. I don't know exactly what kind of nut that is, but there's the raven. You can see how um, in the shading they did some blue. Blue to make him stand out so much darker. I don't know if this is a butternut tree or what, but anyway, there we have them. Eric, you want to talk about the raven? Do we have ravens in Baltimore? Sure. Um, so ravens historically have not been a bird that you can find super, super often in Baltimore. However, in the last few years, due to primarily climate change, we have been seeing more and more ravens in Baltimore um, over the past few years. Uh, there's been a pair that's been nesting up in Towson the past few years that's been getting some notoriety. And notably and ironically, we had a pair nesting on Raven Stadium this year. Um, so these are birds that often get mistaken for crows or for grackles, but once you actually see a raven, you'll notice just how much bigger and how much uh, croakier their call is than a crow. Um, another good way to tell the difference is crows have more rounded tails and ravens have diamond shaped tails. And then my favorite way to tell the difference for any bird in the whole world is that crows tend to have regular straight flight and ravens tend to have erratic flight including doing, and this is in most of the bird ID books, including doing barrel rolls. Um, because even though crows are super, super smart, ravens are just more flamboyant about their intelligence. So <laughs> um, we are getting more and more ravens in the area, but they tend to be a more Western and Northern species. But I mean, I saw one yesterday driving through, uh, driving through right downtown. So they, they are, they are coming, coming around more and more often. This is the last one that you guys selected is the hooded merganser. And the male is a studly looking fellow with his almost shrew-like spouse or girlfriend or whatever you want to call her. She is nowhere near as stately as uh, that grand fellow right there. And you can see her eyes are very plain too. They're not slanted and no eyelashes either. Yeah, so these are birds that are again, one of the more common uh, birds of their type that you can see around the urban and suburban areas in Baltimore. Um, they are short distance migrants, meaning that they typically don't do the long type of migrant that you imagine where they go north to south or south to north. They typically stay in the same general area, but just change habitat. 
Um, so during the breeding season, they'll be in more secluded uh, water, smaller freshwater water uh, waters because just like wood ducks, they nest in the cavities of trees or now because we don't have as much old growth forest and even in the old growth forest, when we have dead trees, people like cutting them down, they'll nest in uh, wood duck boxes. Um, there's another duck that when you're looking for herded mer merganser, you need to be a little bit careful when you're a uh, novice birder learning to identify, and that is the bufflehead, because they will also have that uh, white mohawk that pops up behind their head, and they are both diving ducks that live in the open water. Um, these guys will also live over in larger open, open water areas and even in salt water areas during the non-breeding season. Um, and one of my favorite places to see them is actually Fort McHenry, where you have tons and tons of buffalo heads hanging out, but you also have quite a few of these guys hanging out. And also in that little retaining pond right next to the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore, there was one there all winter, or a pair there all winter. So these are birds that you can see all around as long as you're keeping your eye open. And they are diving ducks, so oftentimes you'll see them for a second, stop to take a better look, realize there's no bird on the water, and you just have to wait a minute or two for them to pop back up. Hey, Steve, can you give us a close-up of the female's mouth and showing the teeth the Teeth. Eric, do you want to talk about that your diet? Yeah, so these guys are almost exclusively fish eaters, which uh, is true of most diving ducks. Um, and the reason why a lot of birds like this and cormorants and things like that have those little ridges on their teeth isn't necessarily because they're chewing their food, but it's because they're catching live fish to swallow whole. And if you have these kind of reverse edges, once they get the fish in their mouth, it'll be a lot more difficult for the fish to back out. Great. Hey, Steve, you mentioned that it was $235 to buy the uh, plate. 220 originally. for the first volume of 100. Okay. So then how much were, are they estimated to be worth now? Um, I believe that our, um, well, there's some stuff. There we go. I believe that our um, appraiser will appraise it at nine and a half or ten million dollars. Um, we're not higher than that because um, we're missing five, obviously. Um, but we have a nearly complete collection. Are you searching for the missing five to add to make your collection complete? Yeah, if you want to sell us the thing for about 500 bucks, we'll take it. Otherwise, it's just out of the question budget-wise. I, I, I uh, thank you so much, Steve. Do we have any questions from folks to Steve or Eric um, about the collection or the library or birds in general? You can put it in the chat box. Steve, is there anything else you want to share with us about the collection? And do you know if any of the uh, legislators at the time were seen in the library looking at the prints? And um, no, I don't think we have a track record of any legislator looking at the prints. However, I just can't believe that that would be true. It's just not documented. And I think if we were to really, it's a very good question. If we were to go over here, for instance, and take a look at all of our catalogs and uh, circulation records, going back obviously prior to um, Thurgood Marshall, uh, we might find something uh, that would approach that. But um, Chip wants to know if all the plates are trimmed. If what's been trimmed? Are all the plates in the collection trimmed? Um, no, I don't think they are trimmed. Um, some of the bigger ones, 
Um, yes, you're obviously trimmed. But um, once you get down to numbers like 13, 14, 15, there's smaller birds, and he did use less canvas space for those. Like if you wanted to go back and look at the um, red winged blackbird, I think there's a lot of room on that canvas still. And uh, that was probably not cut down to size. It's just a shame that the birds are this big. The, um, the osprey, I guess it was, uh, had to be cut. Well, it didn't have to be cut, but they chose to cut it down to size. And they chose to cut it down to size um, because obviously some of the pages were over, overly uh, wide or they were too big. And that was the job of the binder to bind 100 plates in order for that to be a volume. And this goes back to the time when I can actually show you over here. I think I can show you over here. These are um, early law reports from Maryland. And you can see how they're in red binding, some of them but some of them are not in red binding. That's because you had one publisher and a variety of different binders. And so um, that's what happened too with the, uh, with the uh, Audubon prints. Did that answer your question? I think it did. Do we have any other questions about uh, that? And then are we invited to come and, or, or, or to see these? Are they uh, behind lock and key or what's what's up with that? Yeah, yeah they are pretty well locked up. Um, you can see here, hold on. You can see here then we have them in map like uh, shelving where they're opened up and the trays get pulled out. And the first one here is the wild turkey, which, you know, was certainly an aha type of bird. And I'm not going to be able to pull out what's number 15 or whatever. I'm not going to even try that. Bird number five. So bird number 435 is probably not the most greatest looking bird ever. But um, yeah, we're under lock and key and video camera and just about anything we have here we throw at you. But um, people are welcome to call us and make an appointment to come and see as many of these as we have time for. Um, and you can always uh, email us too at lawlibrary.mdcourts.gov. And uh, that goes for legal uh, issues as well. We don't, for, uh, um, our regular customers, we don't say with any definition, what is the law? We say, it sounds like you've got a marital problem. Here's Maryland family law by Judge Fader. And we will give you the book and then you will decide whether or not to proceed in your own case. Um, so that's a little bit different from what other people might be doing or expecting from us. Anything else? Uh, uh, Gail wanted to know how long it took to make each print. Do we know how long it took to make each print? 
No, I don't. I don't. And uh, I don't know what the exact lithographic printing process was that they used. If you look on Google, they refer to Aquatint and they refer to that as kind of an out of date holdover style that they used for Audubon. I mean, he's often connected with the Aquatint process. And um, that I don't know. And I don't know how long it took to uh, color them either. I mean, um, obviously your expectation would be something like the orange and the Oriole um, would take a day or so. And then maybe the legs another day and then the green leaves another day or something like that. But I don't know whether there's any record of how fast they worked. All right, well, I know that Eric has to take off and we're hitting our time. Um, we're gonna be interested in hearing how Gene's uh, uh, research goes as he studies all of the insect species that were included in Audubon's print. Uh, that'll be great. We'll have to have him back and we'll talk about that more. And thank you, Steve, so much um, for sharing the prints with us and uh, giving us a, a sneak behind the scenes look at the Law Library uh, of Maryland. It's a wonderful resource and I hope that uh, folks can take advantage of it. And thanks for taking such good care of those prints. Well, thank you for your interest. It really does our heart good to see that somebody is actually taking a look at these. I mean, judges and law clerks occasionally do, but it's nice to see other people benefiting from that as well. So thank you. Thank you, this was great. Wonderful program. Everybody stay safe, stay well, Take and stay out, stay curious. And uh, we hope to see you at another program very, very soon. Remember next week, Thursday is Corals of Maryland and energy and all kinds of interesting things that I don't, we don't know about that we'll learn. So I hope to see everybody again back here on Thursday. Take care. Thank you.